Are you tired of overpaying for your gold, silver, and platinum bullion coins and bars? Then visit sdbullion.com today. SD Bullion was recently named the 177th fastest growing company in the United States by Inc. Magazine. This is because they offer the absolute lowest prices in the industry and follow up with over the top customer service. So what are you waiting for? Go to sdbullion.com today. Enjoy more than 60,000 happy investors that save money on every precious metals purchase they make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with silverdoctors.com and back with us today is Jerry Robinson from followthemoney.com. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, sure, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. All right, now, you know, on your website, you follow the stock market a lot. Today, we're seeing a really bad day for the stock market. If you look at the Dow, um, what we're seeing happening is that back in January, it hit its peak. It made a correction about 10%. Then it rallied again. Then it made a lower low. And now it's making a third lower low. It seems like to me, this is the start of a new, this is um, a confirmation that we're in a downtrend now. What is your perspective? Well, I think, first of all, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, is, you know, Elijah, that's, that's kind of a, it's just 30 stocks. And so it's a, it's a good barometer, I think, for industrial stocks, but, but that's U.S. industrial stocks, but that's really about it. I think if you really want to pay attention to the trend uh, in U.S. stocks, uh, the number one index to look at is the S&P 500. And we've been tracking the S&P 500 for many years. We use our a special trend system that we've developed here. And right now, uh, we have the uptrend under pressure on the S&P 500, for sure. We've been in a massive, massive uptrend, as you pointed out, for so long. Uh, and it's been very lucrative for those who have been trading the trend. Uh, as we look at the chart now on the S&P 500, we actually see that the price today, as of today, which is Monday, April 2nd, we see the price of the S&P 500 falling through its 200-day moving average. It's a really important uh, average that often serves as an area of support. And in fact, over the last uh, week, we've actually been hovering right above this 200-day moving average. So this week was, I think all eyes were on that 200-day moving average. So we have sliced below it, although uh, we, uh, the market has not closed yet. There's still about another hour and 15 minutes. So there's a possibility that we will close back above the 200-day moving average. And I think that's the most important thing to, to watch is the actual close. Uh, the big traders, smart money on Wall Street, they always pay attention to the volume at the close and the price action at the close. This is when the majority of the big money begins stepping in. So I think if your listeners are concerned about the market, uh, the key thing right now, at least this week, is to be focusing upon how that S&P 500 is interacting with its 200-day moving average, which again is a very, very huge area of support. The reason why that's such a key area of support, at least for our purposes now, uh, is that it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. But what a lot of people do, what a lot of brokers do, is they will set stop losses on the stocks uh, or on the S&P 500 just below the 200-day moving average. That's kind of considered an area of breakdown. And so oftentimes, advisors and uh, stockbrokers, they will place stop loss orders for their customers just below the 200 day moving average. And so whenever we pierce through that uh, and then close below it, the next day we could experience some fierce uh, avalanche of selling. That's kind of the concern that we have here. Uh, although the S&P 500, I will point out, has not gotten to the low that it reached back in early February. In early February, we did pull back to the 200-day moving average, but we were able to rebound above it. So we didn't close below it. So this would be the first close below the 200-day moving average on the S&P 500 in quite a long time. 
And so, uh, and so the key here, of course, is that 200-day moving average, watching the S&P, how it interacts. I would say that right now the uptrend is under pressure. If you take a look at a longer-term trend, like maybe on the monthly chart, for example, Elijah, what you discover is that this uptrend is still fully intact. Uh, is it weak? Yes. Is it under pressure? Yes. Has there been a tremendous amount of volume flowing out of the market indicating that we may be getting ready to experience a trend shift? Yes. Has there been a wild amount of price volatility that is very indicative of a trend transition? Yes. But what has not been actually met is the actual sell signal or the downtrend uh, signal on the S&P 500 on the monthly chart. And I think for people who are long the stock market, if they have money in the market, they should always, of course, talk to a trusted financial advisor. They shouldn't take their advice off of podcasts or AM radio or whatever. But they should be looking at that monthly chart because the monthly chart, if you look at a monthly chart of the S&P 500, you'll see that we have had moments like this uh, during this uptrend. And these often, Elijah, become excellent buying opportunities because they are uh, what we would say mean reversion, so to speak. Uh, and so it's possible that we're sim simply seeing a reversion back to the mean and then we're going to begin to rise back higher. Um, very, very possible. But uh, we don't have a firm uh, downtrend signal yet on the long-term monthly chart. I think when that happens, then uh, there's no doubt that it's important to be in a very defensive posture. Now, personally, Elijah, I am mostly in cash. I've been mostly in cash since February when this stuff when this stuff began, and the reason is is because I have that luxury, so I can get into the market or I can get out of the market. I don't have to stay in. I don't have to buy and hold. I don't. I don't have to, you know, buy into that nonsense. Instead, I simply protect myself against investment losses. That's really the number one key for investors. If you can avoid losing money, then you're way ahead of the game. You'll you'll always be there to survive another day. It's people who, uh, it's those people who don't understand that. They think it's all about making money in the market, uh, and they don't. Worry, they don't worry about their downside protection, and I think that's what you got to watch out for. So, I think once we have a firm long term downtrend on the monthly chart, we'll alert all of our members and let them know what we're doing. We, t we tend to use uh, uh, inverse ETFs to profit from a downtrend. Uh, you can certainly do that here with the current volatility, but it's a lot of whipsaw here. You're getting a lot of up action and a lot of down action. So for somebody who's trying to short-term trade these markets, I would say it's going to be real challenging until the trend becomes extremely clear. Given how interconnected the financial system is right now, what is your perspective on how a uh, collapse in the value of stocks could impact the financial system? Do you think it could like completely freeze up? Well, I think the you know the stock market is a big market. There's no doubt about it. It's a tr you know there's trillions and trillions of dollars floating around in the uh, equity markets. The larger markets that cause greater concern uh, are the credit markets, and so and of course the, the the derivative markets as well. We don't want to get into all of that, but but for but for our purposes here, I would say the stock market is probably the least uh, of our concerns uh, when when compared to the credit market or compared to the uh, derivatives market. Now, the equities market, of course, is a barometer of confidence. And what's happened since the beginning of the year has been a high volume sell off by individuals who are concerned. They're concerned about uh, obviously lots of things, uh, namely uh, what's going to happen to President Trump. I mean, at some point, the crescendo is going to happen with the Mueller with the uh, Mueller investigation, and that will all come to a head. If we take a look at other countries that have s suffered similar kinds of uh, political corruption scandals, what we find is that the market oftentimes tanks dramatically on the news. Consider, for example, Israel and that cesspool of a government run by Benjamin Netanyahu 
who has corruption up to his nostrils. And uh, it's just unbelievable how much corruption is going on in the Israeli stock market. And sure enough, the day that we began to see a lot of the information come out about the proof against Mr. Netanyahu, that is whenever we saw investors began to take cover. We see it in other markets as well, international markets. So when political corruption begins to rock, uh, you know, when it finally begins to uh, to move out into the into the spotlight, and it's actually real and legit, and there's actual facts, uh, the stock market can tumble in a hurry. I think that's a, there, there is a concern here with that. I think one of the things also is I to, to kind of circle back what I was saying earlier is that you don't necessarily have to always be in the stock market. I'm a investor and a trader, but I tend to uh, you know move into a cash whenever I sense the market is getting funny. I mean, I've been in the market uh, for for many many years, riding this bull market up, uh, despite the fact that every Tom, Dick, and Harry was saying that it was going to collapse tomorrow. Uh, and so I've been riding this bull market higher. But what I will do, Elijah, is I will simply move into cash whenever things get funny. They got funny in 2015, and I went to cash. They got a little funny in early 2016, too, and I kind of remained in cash. But about the middle of 2016 on, uh, I was back in pretty much fully in stocks, riding the, the bull market higher throughout 2017 as well. So we're entering again another one of these funny areas. I don't think the immediate solution is to short the market and assume that it's all going to go down in flames. I think the, the, the smarter observation here is to say we're in a period of funniness in the price and volume action in the stock market. And until a clear trend emerges, we probably want to stay on the sidelines. And that's what I'm personally doing now. I mean, you know, always being in the stock market is kind of a folly. Uh, certainly people who lived through the 2008 or 2000 crisis could tell you if they could go back in time and rewind the clock, they would probably take their money out of the market, you know, as the market was imploding. Uh, sadly, most people just leave their money in hoping for a brighter day. They buy and they hope. Uh, so we kind of teach our students the importance of uh, being able to be nimble and move in and out of the market. So as far as the stock market itself, uh, am I concerned about it going forward? Well, sure. But there are many, many catalysts to the upside that still exist, uh, predominantly due to uh, a Federal Reserve that can move uh, on the uh, on a turn of a dime to become more accommodative. Uh, and so I'm sure the Fed's watching all of this. It'll be curious to see how they respond to it. I think any kind of uh, dovish talk from the Fed will kind of be like the uh, the hypodermic needle filled with the, uh, with the dope needed for this market, uh, which is so completely dependent upon fresh money, uh, which for a long time was coming from the Fed, is now mainly coming from stock buybacks. As the tax cuts have begun with President Donald Trump, uh, the tax cuts are being, of course, mainly given to businesses, uh, mainly, uh, almost predominantly to businesses. And those businesses then are taking that money. And what are they doing? Are they hiring new people? Not so much. Are they investing in brand new infrastructure? Not nearly as much as you would think. What they're actually doing, if you look at the numbers, is they are buying their stock. And when they buy their stock back, what that does is, is it's a supply demand function. And it takes some of the stock off of the table and it allows the prices to rise. And so that's really what we've been seeing up until this point. Uh, you know, whether the bullish investor out there uh, can continue to push stocks up, we'll see. Uh, but there are upside catalysts here. Until we have a clear downtrend, we're going to remain uh, neutral on this market. Now, moving our focus to the petrodollar, we recently saw just last week on Monday a really um, big, something that could really impact the petrodollar. The petro yuan was announced 
in the form of you know China announcing the and making uh, real the oil futures contract denominated in yuan. What is your perspective on how this new futures contract could impact the petrodollar and has impacted it this past week? Yeah, well, you know, certainly when you take a look at the U.S. dollar, you see a market uh, that is really uh, quite sad. I mean, the U.S. dollar has had really suffered uh, since Trump Trump has come into office. And that's kind of obvious why. I mean, certainly when we take a look at the policies of um, the Trump administration, you know, we see a, a policies that are simply just driving the U.S. dollar down. Uh, we also, and how do we see this? Why would the U.S. dollar be going down underneath Trump? Shouldn't the dollar should be going up underneath such a nationalist president that is so America first? Wouldn't you expect the dollar to rise underneath a such a nationalistic president? Well, the answer would be perhaps if he wasn't spending everything on a credit card. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that President Trump is basically doing everything that he's doing now uh, with the help of a credit card. This is really what no one uh, is talking about, sadly, but it's just the fact. I mean, we have absolutely positively uh, got ourselves into a pickle when it comes to debt. Uh, that's been obviously pounded into your listeners' brain for some time. I mean, we have seen massive amounts of debt taken on uh, over the last several years. But underneath President Trump, it has really gone to a new place, even more so than President Obama, in the fact that we are now simply uh, borrowing as fast as we possibly can. Uh, the national debt is rising dramatically, and this is putting pressure on the U.S. dollar. So the dollar is falling. On top of that, uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, the Chinese have uh, moved to actually have a currency, uh, a yuan-based contract for oil. Uh, that shouldn't be so unbelievably jarring to the West if we were not so arrogant and assume that everyone must use our currency and that anyone who wants to use their currency is some sort of a problem. Uh, again, this just simply goes back to the arrogance of the United States uh, thinking that it can impose its empire and its currency upon everyone everywhere, and that any time someone will not accept it, uh, then there's a problem with them. Now, there's been people in the past who haven't accepted the U.S. dollar, people like Saddam Hussein. Uh, he was hanging from a tree uh, not too long later. There were people like uh, Gaddafi in Libya. You know, he decided he, he didn't want the dollar. We know what happened to him. Venezuela doesn't necessarily like to use the dollar. North Korea doesn't like to use the dollar. Iran doesn't like to use the dollar. But you know who does? You know who does, Elijah? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia loves to use the dollar. And you know who else Saudi Arabia is? Is They're the same people who practically finance 9-11 based upon all the details that we've received from 28 pages of the 9-11 Commission Report. So interestingly, right now, Elijah, we have the Saudi Arabian king, or his son, the prince, uh, on a big tour across the United States and, uh, you know, just getting all kinds of praise from the media, from business, from politics. And yet the only difference between him and Iran uh, is the fact that he likes the U.S. dollar. They both hate Israel, right? They both want to see Israel destroyed. They both pray to Allah. They both, they both uh, you know, uh, have a hatred for the West. But the difference is, is that the Saudis use the dollar. And so that's all the difference that it makes. That'll get you into the White House. That'll make Mr. President Trump shake your hand and pat your back. But if you won't accept the dollar, then you'll quickly find yourself without friends in Washington. And that's just how it is. And so here with the, with the Chinese Yuan-backed uh, uh, oil contract, I think it's completely fine that the Chinese are doing this. I think, as you pointed out, to the petrodollar system, it's going to erode the amount of demand for U.S. dollars. Because now the Chinese, who are a huge uh, you know, uh, uh, importer of oil, uh, now they can use their own currency. 
And because of this, and for those who don't understand why that's such a big deal, just think about how we got ourselves out of the 2008 mess. Remember back in, in uh, 2008, what did the Fed do? They printed money. Well, why could, why could they print money? Well, how could they print trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and it not create inflation? Well, everybody around the world who wants to buy oil has to get those dollars and hold them. So we kind of have this built-in system, thanks to the petrodollar system, that creates this perpetual demand for our dollars. So even when we overprint them, there are countries out there willing to hold them because they know that they're going to need them to buy oil. So with this new situation with China, um, it's certainly going to erode the dollar demand. And ultimately, that will eventually take away the permission slip that the Fed has had to print money at will. Uh, when the whole world is not simply demanding the U.S. dollar, when there are other currencies competing, then the Fed will find itself in a very tight position where printing new money to solve old problems will lead to actually inflation right here in the United States uh, instead of simply exporting it. So uh, it's an interesting development that's happened. It's not anything new, of course. You know, you've been talking about it for a long time. So have I. We knew it was coming. Uh, it's here. And the dollar is continuing to fall. Uh, it's falling for a number of reasons. This plus the fact as I mentioned, that Washington is using a credit card to pay for everything. They've cut taxes from businesses, and now they're borrowing to do everything else. So how this thing is going to end is exactly how you and I envision it. We're bankrupt. How do bankruptcies end? They end badly. That's how it's going to end for the United States, uh, unfortunately. Um, and the dollar is you know, flashing a warning sign to us right now. All right. Well, Jerry Robinson, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and also um, where to find you online? And I know you're having a summit conference coming up in May, I believe. Thank you so much, Elijah. Yeah, we do. We have an awesome summit coming up for anybody who is in the Midwest. It, uh, it's going to be in Fayetteville, Arkansas, a beautiful little college town in uh, northwest Arkansas. Uh, and it's going to be our Follow the Money 2018 Summit. There we're going to be talking about trading, providing you awesome trading strategies, whether you're trying to trade currencies or you're trying to trade stocks or ETFs or options. We're also going to be talking about making money online. Uh, this is something that many people, many people don't have any money to trade. So they say, well, gosh, I can't make any money because I don't have any money. You know, but So I need to make money. How do I do that? Well, we are going to be teaching at our summit how you can actually make money online using a very powerful system that we're going to be showing you. And uh, what's nice about the summit is it's completely free. We'll also be joined by many other uh, guests as well, including Trace Mayer. He'll be talking about cryptocurrencies. He'll be answering questions. It's still going to be a ton of fun. It's a free summit. If you can get there, it's going to be full of education, financial education. You can find all, out all about it by going to followthemoney.com forward slash 2018 summit 2018 summit and if you just want to look at our website and uh, learn more about us and check out our free podcasts and many of our free articles we've written over the years you just simply go to followthemoney.com elijah you're doing a great job buddy keep up the good work and thanks for having me on all right thank you so much for coming out